great day. Thank God for the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Tonight I'd like to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 2. And we have truly been in the Bible prophets all week. And uh, we have been in the order in which we have been placed in the Word of God. So on Sunday morning we were in what book? Obadiah. Sunday night we were in. So on the Monday night we were in. Last night we were in. And tonight we are in. Have a cup because you're saying, Pastor, if you were here, you would be here tomorrow, would have been in Zephaniah. <laughs> All right. Well, have a cup, chapter 2. And I'm reading verses 1 to 4. Have a cup, chapter 2. And verse number 1. The Bible says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain upon tables, that he may run that reading. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Let us pray. Father, we come before you once again this night, thanking you for your mercy, your love, and your grace. Thank you for this great salvation that you have afforded to us. And thank you because of your love, your mercy, and your grace, and the provision that you have made on Calvary's cross, that when we accept you as personal Lord and Savior, that we can come in the name of the Lord and accomplish great and mighty things. Thank you for who you are and what you're doing in our lives. Thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit that speaks to hearts and fix us in alignment with your precious word. I pray tonight as your word goes forth that you would once again give me the words you'll have me to say. May you fill me with your precious Holy Spirit. Cleanse me of sin. And I pray that as your word goes forth that you would Speak to each heart in a very special way. And that as you speak, each and every person will be willing to listen and to respond in accordance with what you are saying so clearly to us. Take full control. And if there's someone here tonight who does not know you as a person or a savior, for that one who is continuing to hold between two opinions, may tonight be the night. And they say to you, yes, Lord, yes. And I pray that each and every believer would be determined, motivated, challenged, strengthened to continue walking even closer to you. Have your divine way. Do what only you can do. May you receive all the honor, glory, and praise. The seventh begin. In Jesus Christ alone we see. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I grew up in a household where my dad loved boxing and my grandmother loved wrestling. You might be wondering, how come these so-called Christian people love sports so much with all this fighting and violence or perceived fighting? and violence, if you know what I mean, in the case of wrestling. <laughs> well, that's a question for another message. But from watching these two sports in my youth, I learned of the various ways in which a fight is declared over. 
In the case of wrestling, one can do so by holding down the opponent's shoulder and back down, while the referee counts to three, slapping the ground with each count. One, two, three. In boxing, the referee counts to ten and determines if the boxer has sufficient ability to continue the match. In these instances, the competitor is being overmatched and is unable to continue because of the superiority and the dominance of the opponent. However, there are some instances in these sports where the fight is declared over because the opponent or those in his corner have assessed the situation and decided that it is time to voluntarily give up. In boxing in particular, when a boxer is suffering a beating and his corner wants to stop the fight, they literally throw in the towel to indicate that they are conceding the fight. This is the origin of the phrase, throwing in the towel. It means to give up, to avoid further punishment when facing defeat. In the book of Habakkuk, the prophet by the same name was lamenting the dire situation that Israel had found themselves in. In verses 1 to 4, I want to draw your attention there and look at what he says in verse number 1, the burden which Habakkuk, the prophet, did see. He says, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry? And thou wilt not hear. Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not say, Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to be bold grievance? for spoiling and violence are before me. And there are they that rise up, raise up strife and contention. There will the law is slack, the judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass above the righteous. Therefore, wrong judgment proceeded. Here it is that Habakkuk is lamenting the fact that they are in great turmoil. And as we've seen in the other minor prophets, uh, the children of Israel have found themselves in great difficulty because of their sin, their rebellion against God. But if you read further in chapter 1, you will recognize that the situation described by Habakkuk in verses 1 to 4 was just about to get even worse. Because in the subsequent verses, God foretells of the Babylonian captivity where the Chaldeans would come and they would make life very difficult for the people. God himself, in response to their rebellion and to bring judgment upon his people, would raise up heathen kings to bring judgment on his people for their rebellion. Look at verse number 4, 5. It says, Behold, he among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days, which ye will not believe, though it be told you. For lo, I will raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Their horses also are swifter than the leopards and are more fierce than the evening wolves. And their horsemen shall spread themselves and their horsemen shall come from far. They shall fly as the eagle that hasteth to eat. What a dire outlook for the people of God. A situation that was already dire and difficult was about to get worse. But what is so very interesting and instructive is the response of Habakkuk to this prophecy. Habakkuk responds in verse number 11 to the end of chapter 1. And 
For the sake of time, I'll point out a few verses here, but just to summarize, Habakkuk, in response to this dire, destitute, and difficult prophecy, rests in the goodness of his God. God's mercy and God's justice. And essentially, Habakkuk says, God, in spite of what you have just revealed to me, you are not going to let this heathen king destroy and annihilate your chosen people. You're not going to let them make complete mockery of us. I know your nature. I know your character. You are not that kind of God. Yes, Look at what he says in verse number 12. Art thou not from everlasting? O oh Lord, my God, my Holy One, we shall not die. O oh Lord, thou art ordained them for judgment. Speaking of these he is this heathen king and these heathen people. And Almighty God, thou hast established them for correction. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that be trustworthy, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he. Here it is that Habakkuk relied and rested in the fact that he knew, in the spite of the judgment that was pending, that his God was a merciful and loving God. Amen. And this mindset of Habakkuk established a foundation, if you will. It established a, a platform for what we read and what we have read in our text in chapter 2. And I'm so very excited to be able to share these verses in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verses 1 to 4 here tonight. You see, my friends, we are dealing presently with a lot of gloomy looking forecasts in our world right now. From a human perspective, things look bleak. We're still in a pandemic, and while the numbers have declined, thank God for that. We're hoping that we can get to an endemic stage very soon. But my friend, the reality is, none of us are completely sure exactly what's going to happen. Yes. Predictions have been made. And listen, everyone has taken turns at being wrong. <laughs> so much so that people are losing hope and becoming disillusioned with the predictions. I mean, you look at locally the prices of everything. Skyrocketing. I mean, food prices look like they're just doubling and tripling overnight. Water. Gas. Everything is going up. Jobs are scarce and incomes are either reducing or remaining stagnant. The economies of the world are struggling to adapt to the new normal. I mean, people's health are failing. I mean, people are dying suddenly at every age and every stage. I mean, suicides are on the rise. And when you think it couldn't get worse, I mean, here you have a war all in the clear blue sky. Back to the entire world. And I can go on and on and on. My friend, the reality of it is that people are losing hope. But tonight I want to encourage us to have the mindset of Habakkuk. Because with the, habit, the mindset that Habakkuk demonstrated in chapter 1 that God revealed to him in the middle of this dire prophecy a message of hope. A message that gave Habakkuk confidence amidst all that was happening. And Habakkuk had a resolute mindset that said, in spite of what I've just heard, in spite of what is about to come, I can go on. In fact, I must go on. Amen. Amen. And I want to preach a message this morning, tonight rather, entitled, Hold on to your tongue. My friend, this is not the time to throw the towel back in your head. My friend, this is the time amidst all that is going on in our world to hold on to your tongue. 
But what happens is that when you come up higher, you have a different, clearer, and better perspective of the same situation. Nothing has changed. But your perspective is more one from God's perspective. My friend, we can only acquire a perspective of God by coming up higher and being closer to God. Amen. Seeing situations of this life through the word of God, through spiritual eyes. Habakkuk elevated his position. He was entrenched in his purpose. But notice, as a result of those two things, he acquired an essential perspective. Look at what he said in verse number one. And will what? Watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Now, he could not get to this essential perspective until he elevated his position. You see, my friends, here's what Habakkuk was saying. Through all the trials of life, through all of the judgment that, that is being meted out on, on God's people, God is speaking. And because God is speaking, I need to listen. God is saying something, and as a result of this holy God saying something, I need to have the right response. God is teaching through the circumstances of life, and I need to learn. There was a realization that there are some things that he needed to learn. There was also a realization that there were some things that he was doing wrong. That is why he said, and what shall I answer when I am reproved? He was expecting correction. He was expecting to be rebuked. And he was saying, even before God reveals to me what I'm doing wrong, let me endeavor even beforehand to make sure that I have the right attitude to what God is going to reveal to me. Yeah. Wow. You know, oftentimes why we don't have the right attitude is because we no longer possess a teachable spirit. And we want to throw in the towel and God is saying to us, listen, my friend, my child, my student, class is still in session. And if you leave now, you won't learn. If you leave now, you won't graduate to the next level. Years ago, I remember speaking with a young man who was about to join the U.S. Marines. And he was looking forward to it. And I've always, I'm sure you might have as well, seen and heard stories of what boot camp looks like and the difficulties that they would be enduring to become a, a Marine. And a number of years later, I ended up having another conversation with him after the boot camp, which he had successfully completed. I remember so clearly asking him, did you want to quit? When things were tough, when it was so grueling, when it seems like the obstacles and all of the things that they were doing to toughen you up as a soldier, did it, did it seem like you wanted to just, you know what, I no longer want to do this. I just want to go back home and forget this. He said, no, I didn't want to quit. I wanted to graduate. Amen. My friend, we need that kind of resolve in difficult times. When God uh, allows things in our lives to be able to uh, mold us and to, to get us to where he wants us to be, my friend, rather than deciding to throw in the towel, our resolve ought to be, God, I know this is tough, but listen, you have made me for such a time as this, I want to graduate Amen. to the next level. Amen. 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 He had a positive attitude. This is the attitude of Habakkuk, recognizing that he was about to face even a more difficult situation than the one he was going through. But notice with me, secondly, the 
a purposeful assignment. A purposeful assignment. Look at verse number two. It's amazing that when one's attitude is right, God reveals more stuff. He says, and the Lord answered me and said, write the vision. You know what's important about this assignment? And what's so instructive from this passage? That God was saying to Habakkuk, I want you to document something. And I firmly believe that things that are of importance are to be written on. They are to be documented. I had a teacher who would say, the shortest pencil is longer than the longest memory. And what God was saying to Habakkuk, Habakkuk, what's happening now is for a reason. It's part of a, a bigger vision. Right now, everyone is getting distracted with the current events. But I have a plan. I have a purpose that's bigger than the present struggles and the pending captivity. So Habakkuk, write down the vision as I reveal it to you. But if you're like me, I believe most of you would be like me, it's just a matter of human nature, we tend to forget what we don't write on. I mean, no matter how wonderful it is, years and years pass and we struggle to remember the details. But God was saying to Habakkuk, listen, write down the vision. It is so important. I want you to be guided by it. I don't want you to forget it. Listen, write down what God has done for you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Write down the prayers he has answered for you. Yes, sir. Write down the goals that he has placed on your heart, the dreams that you hope to accomplish. And that God said to Abraham, this is a purposeful assignment. Document it. Yes, yes. He says to him regarding this vision, let it be distinct. He says, make it what? Clean upon the table. In other words, make it clear. Make it specific. I don't want it to be confusing. I don't want it to be puzzling. Listen, I, and I'm so glad that God has given men of God visions to see things accomplished. Amen. Amen. I know your pastor is a man of vision. And I know you have a vision statement. Listen, let that saturate your heart and your mind manager, I'm sure you would agree with me that when you write things down, the expectations, the objectives, you're more likely to get results. Why? Because you're able to hold one another account accountable for what needs to be done. Here God was saying to Habakkuk, Habakkuk, don't throw in the towel. Now is the time to make the vision clear so that others might not be distracted by what's going on around, but they can be focused to do what I called them to do. Amen. Write down the vision. Why is the vision so important? It gives you something to strive for. In our problems, and our problem rather, when difficulty comes, is that we stop running and we throw in the towel because we stop looking at where we are going and we start looking around at what's happening. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's what Peter's problem is. He stepped out of the boat and he started walking on the water. And as long as he was focused on where he was going, he was doing wonderfully well. We talk about Peter in negative ways, but he's the only man apart from Jesus to walk on water. Why was he doing that? He was focused on where he was going. But when he got distracted about what was happening, he began to say, my friend, now is the time to embrace our purposeful assignment and determine I will not throw in the towel. I will not be distracted by what's happening around. I will not be distracted by COVID. I will not be distracted by failing health. I will not be distracted by Ukraine. I will not be distracted by Putin. I will not be distracted by the person of my job. I will not be distracted by those who don't want to serve God. But I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus. Yes, yes. It was a purpose.
was for assignment. Yeah. What's your assignment? Do you have a purpose for existing that in alignment with God's will for your life? My friend, when you embrace God's will for your life and you keep your eyes on Jesus, you can run, come what me. Amen. Amen. With a purpose for assignment. But notice thirdly, the powerful assurance. Look at verse number three. It says, for the vision is yet for what? An appointed time. My friend, when God gives us a task, when God gives us a responsibility, make no mistake about it, it is by, first of all, divine appointment. God always has a purpose. God always has a plan. And my friend, God is always in complete control. Nothing catches him by surprise. We have scheduled planners. We have phones and we have things that we use to keep us on track. And even though that we have all these devices, sometimes we still forget why we can't know everything. We don't know everything. We can't see everything. Things come unexpectedly. But when it comes to God, God is divine and he does things by divine appointment. Yes, you are not here tonight by accident. Yes, That's right. He says, the vision is yet for an appointed time. And it's important for us to understand that an appointed time has a defined period in which the job must get done. But notice, what's so powerful about this assurance? Not only that it has God's divine hand upon it, but when it's all said and done, the God of the universe will be deemed accurate. Amen. Amen. Look at what it says. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. My friend, in spite of all that's happened in the world, in spite of all of the naysayers, when all is said and done, God will be proven to be true 100% of the time. Amen. Romans chapter 3 verse number 4 says, God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. My friend, God's way is not only the best way, but God's way is the right way. God's way is the way that is just. God will be proven to be right. Yes. He will be deemed accurate. That's a powerful assurance. And as a result of this assurance, look at what the Bible says. You can embrace a determined attitude. It says, go in time. Do what? Wait for it. Because it will surely come. It will not tarry. My friend, we are not to throw in the towel because God's timing is always perfect. Amen. And here's what I'm learning and finding out about God. Sometimes we are running. And we're just running a little too fast. And God, because his timing is perfect, he knows what to do just to slow us down. Sometimes God is saying, my, my friend, my brother, my sister, or my child, you are running too fast. I like sports, even though I wouldn't want to play. But I love watching, I love following, I love track and field. And we know one of the most exciting races in track and field is the relay race. And the relay race is a race that not only requires speed, but it requires precision. It requires timing. It requires not running outside your lane. It requires not running past your 
area. Listen, if you do, you will be disqualified. And sometimes what happens in our lives, we are running, and we are running, and God is saying, where are you going? If you didn't get the battle yet. So if you run with all your speed and get to the finish line and have no button, what's the use? To disqualify. My friend, when it comes to this life, God has a timing. God has a purpose. God has a place where he wants you to be in the right place at the right time so that you can receive what he has for you and run with it. Amen. Don't run ahead of God. Here's the thing about the relay race. You can be the fastest runner, but you can't run outside your zone. You gotta get that baton in the right place so that you can be uh, qualified to be a winner. Amen. And guess what else you can do? You can't run in somebody else's lane. That's right. You know what a lot of us are doing in this life? Right. Running and running and taking our own lane and watching what Tom is doing. Yeah. What
that we cannot hold on to your top of this. You can't trust your own physical eyes, your own outlook on life, the predictions of the pundits, the predictions of all those who like to make us think that they know exactly what they're saying. You will be sustained by your personal faith in God. Look at what this verse is. The just shall live by what? His faith. You're not going to live this life relying on your mother's faith, on your father's faith, on the pastor's faith, on the Sunday school teacher's faith. Listen, those are not going to be enough. You must believe in God for yourself. Amen. Yes. Amen. Right. When you do, no matter how hard things look, no matter how bleak things seem to be, you will be assured that God has a plan. God has a purpose. Why? Wow, he's given me a vision. He's given me a purpose for existing. And these difficulties that I'm experiencing, they're all part of God's divine plan to get me where he wants me to be so that I can accomplish what he's called me to do. See, my friend, every man, woman, boy, or girl, God has a plan and purpose. Will you embrace it? Will you stand firm in the face of difficulty? Will you believe that God not only can do it, but that God will do it? You see, you can't run in faith unless you have already understood your purpose. Hebrews 11, we call it the fall of faith. These people were just like us. They were made up of the same stuff. But God had made promises to them. That even though they could not see how it's going to happen, listen, they rely on the promises of God. And that's why when it's all said and done, the Bible saw them as individuals who had. When you embrace confidence in the song, and that is reinforced by the fact that you understand God has a specific plan and purpose for my life. You will have the confidence, determination, and come what me, whatever happens, God will see me. And as such, this towel is not going in the rain. This towel is going to be held firm in my hand. Amen. Because God has a final purpose for my life. Amen. Will you hold on to your tongue? A lot of people are throwing me. Listen, they're not even dropping this. They just throwing me. And I said to each and every person, you are saved by the grace of God. God has a purpose in you. Amen. Don't worry. Hold on. Don't wait for your time. Wait for your time. It's going to come. God is doing something in all that's happening. He has a plan and purpose for our churches, but He also has a plan and purpose for your life individually. And that purpose of the connected. His plan for His church. Why? Because His church is His kingdom building the kingdom that He has ordained and established to accomplish His will. You're here tonight, you're not a born again believer. God has a plan and purpose for your life. But it begins with salvation, it begins with accepting Jesus Christ. The provision of sin. And tonight, 
I want to encourage you. If ever you will, let Jesus have his way to your heart. You will not be afraid. You know, to the, today, as I reflected on the messages and I reflected on God's word, and oftentimes, time of invitation is quite a sobering, very serious time. Because decisions are being made that will impact eternity. And I thought to myself, when the world is presented, and when Jesus is presented as the way, the truth, and the life, I thought to myself, well, there's a real battle that's raging for the souls of men. Because here it is that Jesus is giving an open invitation, and yet there appears to be a pull that is pulling individuals to say, no, don't go to Jesus. I say to you, whatever is pulling you from Jesus can never be your right. It could never, ever be. And if it appears to be, it is a lie from the pits of hell. And so I say to you, whatever God is saying to you, you're here tonight that you're not saved, I beg of you, I plead with you. I wish that I could take my faith and I could lodge it to your account. But it doesn't work that way. It says, the just shall live by his altar. So you must demonstrate your faith. I encourage you. You're not favorite. You. Don't leave this. Here was an opportunity to take a Bible and show you Jesus. If you're here tonight and you're born again in Israel, I know at times things get tough. I don't want to encourage you. Don't be much. Don't fall into trouble. God is doing something. God is speaking. Don't be so back with you. God had not even spoken to me. And he says, listen, I'm going to get my ears ready. I'm going to get my mind ready. I'm going to have my heart prepared. So that whatever it is that he's saying to me, I have the right to speak. What is God saying to me? What aspect of your life has God spoke to this to Are you ready to respond to Whatever it is, I encourage you to submit to the Savior. He will give you the strength. He will give you the purpose. He will give you what you need to continue the path of your masterpiece. Who is your purpose? Whatever you're going through in life, you're going through a life. I beg of you, hold up. Father, I thank you for your presence. I pray tonight for every man, woman, boy, or We know that your word is quick, it's powerful, sharper than any two edges. You say that your word is not returned to And I pray tonight for hearts in which the seed has fallen. Pray that the seed will fall on good ground to me. Pray that it will take root and bear fruit. I pray for that soul that is caught in between two things. I pray that you will help that one to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of his sins. I pray that there will be nothing that will hinder that decision to make. I pray for every morning and evening. Many who are perplexed and struggling with the trials and the tribulations of this life, I pray that you would encourage that heart here today. May we all be in alignment with your vision, with your plan, with your purpose, recognizing that 
get on the time zone. And you're working for a specific purpose. Our good. They work for you. How do you define it? Has Satan been defeated for? May he have no occasion to rejoice over any person given. May he leave here wounded and beaten and defeated. I think that we will save some lost sin. Serve the hearts of every believer. We will be strengthened, motivated, challenged to run this race with passion, with enthusiasm, with faith. Have you defined it? Where have you been? In Jesus' name, right? Let me go and invite you. Tell me tonight, you are born again.